All right, y'all, welcome back to my Arms channel. Okay, so I'm super excited about this video. So you guys might have seen the videos I did previously where I was doing like a close quarters battle or CQB instructional series. Now, there was something I really wanted to touch up on and I kind of talked about it a little bit, but that's going to be the nighttime considerations or you know low light or no light considerations. Now, I will say right off the bat that it's going to be very equipment heavy just you know, given the fact that you need to create light or you need to do something so you can actually see what you're going into, it's going to be a little more equipment heavy. So we're gonna talk about the equipment for those no light, low light situations. And with that, we're gonna talk about what equipment is best for certain methods. Because again, you do have the stealth method of CQB or you have the dynamic, which stealth, of course, you're, you're trying to do nonverbal communications. You're trying to, you know, go throughout the house using less noise and less light. So you're gonna be very light discipline oriented, sound discipline oriented, and you're gonna do things a little bit differently. Dynamic is pretty much just using the whole gambit of what you have for CQB. That's going to be more of the violence of action. So you're using flashbangs, you're breaching very heavy, you're using verbal communications. So it's more about the shock and doll, less about the, you know, trying to be discovered, less of the surprise aspect. So people might generally think with no light or low light situations, you're going to wanna to be stealthy all the time. And that's not necessarily the case because you know, if you go into a house and you know, you're know you throwing flashbangs, you're using white lights, you're blinding people, there's going to be a lot of shock and awe, especially if it's like after hours where someone's like tired or what have you, when you compile all that stuff, it's really gonna mess with their heads. So yeah, we're gonna talk about the equipment first. You can see I have a few things here in front of me. We're gonna talk about some of the stuff you could wear and then some of the more like weapon oriented stuff. So starting off over here, we just have a basic play carrier. Now what I like about this Feral Concepts Slingster is it's very minimalistic. So if you are trying to go about that, that stealth method of entry, it's really nice to have gear that's very streamlined. So it's not moving around as much. There's not as much jangling around. And at the same time, you're not going to be hitting as much because you have stuff that's a little bit more compact. So obviously, if you're rock, rock, rocking like, you know, hydration or comm setup, it's going to get a little bit bulkier. But again, the Ferro Concept Slickster just makes it a little bit easier to keep things pretty streamlined. And then with that, having a good belt setup, I kind of talked about this previously, having a good belt setup is very, very crucial. Having a sidearm, pretty much with any sort of CQB environment is, I would say it, it's probably a must because you never know what's gonna happen when you're inside the enclosure. Because if you have a weapons malfunction or even if you just run out of ammo, having a secondary is really, really crucial, especially since you're in such a confined space, you're in such close quarters, you're not going to have that much time to react to you know, reload your firearm or, you know, clear a stoppage or what have you. It's really nice to be able to transition to a sidearm because as we know, transitioning to your pistol is always going to be faster than reloading. And that's just, that's a proven fact. We've done it on the channel. It's definitely an effective thing. And for CQB, it's totally fine to be able to transition to a pistol because it's such close quarters, it's such short ranges, a pistol is usually going to do pretty fine. And it's nice to be able to get that firepower in the fights as opposed to try and take a little bit more time getting your primary up. And then yeah, we just have some other basic stuff. So of course we have magazine pouches for our prime or for our secondary. We have a med kit. Again, this is just a blue force gear micro um, tourniquet now or trauma kit now. It's really nice because again, it's just really streamlined and it's got pretty much all the necessities in there. We have a tourniquet and then we just have an admin pouch with some shotgun shells if you're gonna be doing like some breaching or what have you. Now over here, we have the Benelli M1014. That's kind of just to even out the framing and what have you, but I mean, it also looks cool. Now. Combat shotguns, definitely a very valid weapon you can use for CQB. It's been proven even in like, you know, Fallujah or what have you. I mean, it's just, it's an effective weapon system. But if you need to be a little bit more discreet in where you're placing your rounds, then you probably want something like a submachine gun or, you know, a so, sort of a more compact, you know, pistol caliber carbine or just uh, a smaller rifle or a bullpup rifle. So having something like this, like a P90, is definitely going to be a little bit more preferred, especially when you're trying to reduce that collateral damage. And at the same time, if there's, you know, hostages or, you know, you're in a specific environment, maybe like nuclear security, you're not going to want something that's not necessarily so precise 
if that makes any sense. So now we're gonna move on to some of this stuff. I'll get to the helmet in a little bit because that's going to talk about something else. But yeah, you can see here, this is a great primary weapon system for CQB. So this is the FN, this is a PS90, pretty much just a semi-automatic P90. And what we have on here is a Vortex UH-1, which is a holographic sight. I love holographic sights in CQB. I'm not sure if I would use anything besides that. So Vortex, EOTech, very, very solid options. And at the same time, both of those have a night vision setting. And we'll talk about why that's important later on in, in sort of allowing you to have more methods of entry when it comes to CQB, especially the stealth method of entry. But yeah, this is a very solid optic, highly recommend it. And then on the other side, we have a Surefire flashlight. Now this has a white light and an IR setting, so an infrared setting. And again, we'll talk about why that's important later on. But yeah, the P90 is fantastic. It's very, very short, very compact. And of course, we have 50 round magazines, which is just nice because obviously you don't want to be reloading so much, especially in a CQB environment. So definitely a great little tool for CQB. It's gonna be a little bit harder to get the barrel this length, but if you guys are willing to put in the effort, then yeah, this thing will pay dividends for sure. So definitely recommend it. The five, seven round is pretty effective for you know what it's supposed to be doing. It's supposed to penetrate body armor a little bit better. That's questionable sometimes, but I think it does a pretty good job, especially in CQB. Now, talking about sidearm, I always have a flashlight on the sidearm itself. This one does not have an infrared, which you know kind of sucks, but it's okay. To get infrared and white light in a package this small, it's not going to happen too much. And again, it is your secondary. It would be nice to have it, but if you're pulling out the secondary, you need more firepower very quickly. So you're probably not gonna care too much if this is white light or infrared. But yeah, this is just a Beretta 92X compact, pretty solid pistol. Now this does also have a Trigicon RMR on it, which, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. Iron sights are going to work perfectly fine, especially for a secondary, you know, having a, a sidearm, you're not necessarily going to need an RMR on it. And a lot of people will even advise against you because a lot of people are very comfortable with iron sights. So if you're going to be trying to use an RMR, just make sure you train on it so you can actually, you know, acquire your sights and get rounds on target effectively and quickly, pretty much as quickly as you would with iron sights. So it's always gonna be about how much you actually train. Now, of course, we also have our little flashbang here. This is a reloadable flashbang. It's just a nice little tool. It's more of a diversionary device. It's not going to, you know, mess up someone's vision. It's just, if something falls into the room, people tend to look at it. So they're gonna look at it. It's gonna do a little bit of a flash, but it's also gonna make a noise. And just having that sort of sensory overload can help you, you know, in, in certain situations. And again, if you're going dynamic, then it's just a, a nice tool. Ideally, you'd have something that's a little bit louder, something that goes, you know, flash a little bit better, but that's a pretty good tool. Now, moving on to the helmet. So, this is just a bump style helmet. Um, it doesn't really matter, I would say. When it comes to CQB, it's nice to have a ballistic helmet for sure. I would always advise a ballistic helmet. But again, you need to consider what those ballistic helmets are for. They're not for stopping rounds. They might stop a pistol round or some fragmentation, but they're not really gonna stop rifle rounds. So I would recommend a ballistic helmet, but having a bump style helmet is also you know, a, a nice option, as long as it can support your night vision pretty well. So we can see here, this is a Team Wendy x -Fill. So I also have some night vision on here. And then we also have some, these aren't Peltors, kind of just electronic hearing protection, but having some that are integrated with your helmets are nice, especially when you have the electronic hearing protection, because when you're in a CQB environment, it's going to get very, very loud. And of course, you're gonna to wanna to maintain your situational awareness. So having that is nice, so you're not going deaf. And so you can hear your buddies communicating when the gunfire actually stops. Now, here is night vision. Night vision is a fantastic tool. If you're trying to go as stealthy as possible, having something like night vision is very, very nice. Again, it gives you that infrared spectrum. So as long as you have some sort of ambient light inside the enclosure, you can use night vision pretty effectively. And if you don't, if you have like an infrared light, then you could also use it pretty effectively. So this is just a PVS-14. This is a TVNBC 
white phosphor, PBS14. Of course, it's going to be more preferred for you to have dual tube, or of course, if you want to have you know, panoramic night vision, that's totally fine. It's just depending on what your budget can, can offer you. But yeah, this is just a PBS14 mono tube. It's good, it's going to be effective. Of course, if you have a dual tube, it's going to make your depth perception a little bit better. Well, a lot a bit better, especially when it comes to CQB. So if you, can, if you can get the dual tube, definitely recommend it. It's going to pay dividends when it comes to an environment like this. And you're really worried about the spacing and the angles of everything. Okay, so why is all this stuff important? Well, having all of this gives you options. So if you're trying to go dynamic, Implementing that diversionary device is going to be a fantastic thing. Using that white light is going to be fantastic. If you have a flashlight that has a strobe, that's even better because again, you want to have all this sensory overload, especially when you're implementing the speed, surprise, advance of action. If you have these tools to assist you with that, it's going to make things a lot easier. So that's going dynamic. If you wanna go stealthy, you can utilize night vision. So you're seeing on an infrared spectrum, you're not using visible light. If the adversary doesn't have night vision, if they can't see on that infrared spectrum, it makes things a lot easier for you because it can be pitch black inside of a building. But if you have an IR flashlight and some night vision, you can light things up, you can see things just fine and the enemy cannot. So again, having that just makes it so much easier. So let's take an example. You're, you're a bad guy, you're defending a house or you know a certain building and you're looking down a hallway, but it's really, really dark. There's not a whole lot of ambient light and your eyes haven't adjusted yet. So you're pretty much going off of sound or maybe like a little bit of, of silhouette here and there, maybe like a reflection of, of some ambient lights. And all of a sudden you, you start taking rounds because somebody just popped out at the end of the hallway and they are casting their infrared light right in your face and you have absolutely no idea because you're only on that visible light spectrum and you're just you're trying to wait for your eyes to adjust if you have a white light like a flashlight that's fine that's going to be good for you but you're probably not going to have that on the whole time because of course if somebody comes into the hallway they're about to enter the hallway they know you're watching the hallway because they see your white light. So they're probably not gonna go where the white light is because obviously they're gonna be seen. So they're going to use all of that to their advantage. And again, just having access to that infrared spectrum makes it a lot easier to be stealthy so you can reduce your signature. Now, things to consider, of course, if the enemy does have night vision, you probably don't want to be going through the house with infrared lasers on or infrared flashlights on until you actually need to use them, until you're actually trying to identify threats or engage the threats because they're gonna see those lasers moving around, they're gonna see those lights moving around. So with all of this, you just need to be disciplined in how you're implementing all of it. Now with all of that said, there's still a lot of things to consider. So when you're talking about setting up your weapon, you can have a flashlight, you can have a laser. Having an IR laser is going to be nice, especially for a CQB environment, just so you can get some quick rounds on target if you really need to. It's good for just general target acquisition. Of course, you always wanna rely on your, your primary optic, but if you can get a laser, again, it's just more options for you. Now, all of that is good, but it's going to be how you're actually setting up all this, how convenient you're making this stuff for you. So right now, I have a Surefire flashlight. I can manipulate it. it. I mean, it's easy to switch from IR to white lights. However, this weapon doesn't actually have a pressure switch on it. So basically what that means, if I need to actuate it, I'm going to be pressing the button in the back, which is not going to be ideal because you can see this is generally how, how I would hold the weapon, but if I'm trying to actuate the light, I'm going to have to switch up my grip a little bit, which is not going to be preferred because again, you always wanna to stick to what you're used to doing, what you're trained with. So having a pressure switch, if you can put like a, a pressure switch somewhere convenient, the P90, not gonna lie, it's, it's kind of awkward. It makes it a little bit difficult. But if you can find a good place to put that pressure switch, it makes it a lot easier so you can keep a normal grip and still actuate your light or your laser or what have you. So if you have that option, if you have the money to afford a pressure switch, definitely recommend it. So you can see here, I can still do it just fine. It's not messing up my grip too much, but again, it's not preferred. If you can make things a little bit easier for you, it's definitely going to pay off. Now, having a sling, again, is going to be preferred. If, I mean, even if you're going against someone who doesn't have like, you know, a weapon themselves, if they can just pull your weapon out of your hand, it's gonna be a bad day for you and probably your buddy. So having a sling is very necessary, especially if you need to transition to your secondary, you can drop your primary, get to your secondary, and you're still good. So it's nice having this. 
It's also nice having a good sling setup. So you can see here, this one is okay. Now we talked about this in another video, but if y'all are going to be implementing switching shoulders in the actual house, whenever you're actually operating or doing whatever, you need to be able to practice that and you need to be able to set up your weapon that way. If you're not gonna practice it, then don't do it. It might look cool, but you're probably gonna get schwacked because you're not used to you know, actually switching and you know, acquiring your sights on this shoulder. Now you can see what I did there because this weapon is so short and it's ambidextrous and it has a one point sling. It's a lot easier for me to just switch shoulders. I'm not even having to change my grip up or anything. I can just pop it over to this shoulder and just fine, I can acquire my sights. So very easy day. Another reason why I love the P90. So if I'm trying to get around this corner, I can do that. If I need to switch, I can do that just fine. Now the same thing pretty much goes for pistols. So when I was in the Marine Corps on the recapture tactics team, we had a Beretta with a Surefire X300. And then we also had a pressure pad that ran underneath the trigger guard to the grip. So you pretty much just use your middle finger to actuate the pressure pad, which was really, really nice. But with this one, it works just fine. You don't really need that in you know today's lights. You can just use your non-firing hand or your, your non-dominant hand, and you can usually actuate it like that. So you can click it on or you can hold it. So it's very easy. These are ambidextrous, so even if you wanna use this, and of course I wouldn't recommend using your trigger finger to actuate it because you're going to cast a light on someone. You might blind them, which is you know kinda good, but yeah, at this point you can't engage. So of course you wanna use that non-firing hand to actuate everything. And this is very easy, very intuitive. So using this, using something like this is no problem. So this is actually a Streamlight TLR 7 Alpha works pretty well on this. It's just something to consider. You obviously need to get a holster that can accommodate the light. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about night vision. So I already talked about how this Vortex has a night vision setting, which is really nice. So there's a few different ways to utilize night vision. Again, I'm using a monotube. So if you're using a monotube, if you don't have a night vision optic, I mean, you can just rock it on your, you know, your non-firing side. So right now it's on my left side. So I can still actuate a laser. I can actuate a flashlight. I can use that for target acquisition, but I'm probably not going to be implementing my primary optic too much, unless again, it has a night vision setting or I can just, you know, work it somehow. So if I flip this sucker onto the other side, now it's on my firing side. So since this does have a night vision setting, that means I can see the reticle through my night vision, which is really, really nice. Again, because even if you just have an optic like this, if you think, you know, the enemy probably won't see your reticle when it's on the normal function, it's still visible light. And if they're rocking infrared lights, it's probably not gonna be good for you because there might be something reflecting off of something and it's gonna give your position away. So you wanna minimize that stuff as much as possible. So having that night vision setting is nice because again, at this point, I can utilize my primary optic. Although you need to, again, you need to train with it. So we'll talk about that a lot. You need to be able to use this stuff effectively. And in order to do that, you just need to train with it. So right now I'm inside a house, I'm scanning. I see something move around. I'm trying to identify and see if it's actually a threat. So with that positive identification, I could use my, my light, my IR light. I'm just trying to see what it is. Once I deem it's actually a threat, all I need to do is pop my optic up, take the weapon off safe and engage. Again, it's, take, it's gonna take a little bit of practice to be able to find that reticle through your night vision to get that alignment just right, but you will be able to get it if you train on it quick enough. Of course, if you're being stealthy and they don't have access to infrared, it doesn't necessarily need to be as quick, but you always wanna be able to eliminate a threat as quick as possible once you deem it as a threat. So I'm scanning, I see something, get positive identification, pop up and engage. So it gets pretty easy. So again, having an optic that works with your night vision just gives you options. And again, with everything, it's nice to have options. Oh, this is weird, someone's gonna, someone's gonna Photoshop this. <laughs> Now with all of that said, of course you want to get the weapons manipulations down. So when it comes to implementing a flashlight or even a laser, you don't want to have it on all the time. Again, if they have access to night vision and you're casting an IR light or an IR laser all over the place, 
it's going to give away your position. And of course that goes for visible lasers and white lights as well. So when you're actually trying to identify threats, you can start using that flashlight. That is totally fine. If there's an area or a dead space that you're trying to clear out, if you can't actually see what's in there, it is totally okay to utilize your flashlight for that. But of course you don't wanna be you know, leaving this on you know, going throughout a house, casting a light all over everything. So a good way to think about it is you're using your, your flashlight as a second trigger. It's not necessarily going to be the same effect as this trigger where you're implementing deadly force, but you're utilizing it to identify a threat or see if there's a threat in a certain area. So you don't always want to be actuating it. You want to have good trigger control of that flashlight. So. I'm checking some dead space, that's totally fine. If I see something move, I'm trying to get positive identification. And again, at the same time, it's nice. If you have a strobe or something, you can start using it to blind someone. So it serves a dual purpose. Now I see a threat, I'm gonna turn my flashlight on, it blinds them, I get positive identification, and then I can start engaging. And the same thing works when it comes to an IR light. All right, so I'm probably gonna look a little bit weird, but again, so you guys get the idea, we are operating on the infrared spectrum now. So flipping down my night vision, turning this sucker on. Again, if I, a night vision is good, but if you don't have that ambient light, then you're still not going to see anything because all this thing does is amplify the light that's already there. Now, if you don't have a whole lot, then you're, you're not going to see that well. But if you have a flashlight that works with infrared, you can add some light. So right now I can't really see a whole lot. There's not a whole lot of you know, ambient light. So I'm gonna use my flashlight and just like that, it's super easy. Now, if you don't have night vision, then you're not going to see anything. It's still going to be a very dark room. But again, the same principles apply. If you're talking about peer-to-peer -peer warfare or someone that might have access to night vision, you don't wanna be walking around like this. It's going to be so much worse for you. So again, pretend it's like a second trigger. I'm trying to clear out some dead space. I'm doing that. If I see something moving, I'm trying to get positive identification. I'm gonna utilize my flashlight, and then if I need to, I can start engaging as well. And of course, the th same thing applies if I'm trying to use my actual optic. I can still use my flashlight. If the optic is set to a good setting, you can still utilize your IR lights and still see through your optic and utilize your reticle. So you're creating that light for you if you don't have the ambient light, and then you can still engage just fine. And of course, the same is going to apply if you're using your, your secondary. So primary goes down, I'm gonna drop it, transition, and then actuate my flashlight. So just like that, it's very intuitive, and you can pretty much get it ready right out of the drawer. The drawer, man, that was such a New Jersey way of saying it right there. So again, you're gonna draw it, get it out, flashlight is engaged, very, very easy. Again, it's nice how the modern lights are set up, because they just make it super easy, super intuitive for you to utilize it. Okay, so to end this video, I'll do a little demonstration. Now, again, all the same principles are going to apply. CQB is just a game of angles. So if you haven't seen the previous CQB videos I did, I definitely recommend checking them out because you might have some questions on what you're seeing. But again, I'm gonna do everything. I'm going to actuate the, the white light and then also the IR light so you guys can see what I'm talking about. But that is pretty much all I have time for today. Again, these are those nighttime or those no light, low light considerations. It's not, it's not necessarily telling you how to do it because people are going to do things differently. You're going to have access to different equipment. Your job is going to be different. Someone who works on a SWAT team who is you know trying to do really quick paced hostage rescue stuff is going to do things very differently from what I was taught, which was pretty much very slow and methodical because we worked in nuclear facilities. Of course, you're gonna wanna be very slow and methodical to make sure you clear out everything very slowly and you're generally going to be going into the unknown in a lot of situations. So you can't really prep for everything. You can have a general plan and general tactics and a good idea of how you wanna do it. But of course you need to be able to utilize the initiative and with CQB, 
You just need to do a lot of repetitions to be able to get proficient in using that initiative on the fly. But hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Of course, let me know what you think. I love doing these types of videos. Of course, you guys know CQB is pretty much my bread and butter. Now, there are a lot of different ways to do it, as I've already said. So if you guys have some good advice on how to do things a little bit differently, how to do things a little bit better, then definitely put it down below. Of course, there's a lot of things to consider, especially just even with like your kit. Sometimes you'll put on some gear and you'll look at it, you look at it under, you know, like maybe even white lights or visible lights and it looks super fine. It's not really reflective, but all of a sudden you tuck that infrared light on, you're using night vision and then you look at your gear and all of a sudden it, it's glowing like a Christmas tree. Not necessarily so good. So definitely do some research on what is, you know, IR reflective, what is not, what sorts of materials work best or, you know, certain brands that have just been there and done that and they know what to use, how to implement their gear so it is effective for you in those sorts of nighttime environments. So a lot of research can go into it. Of course, I'm not gonna be able to go over everything. So if you guys have some advice or something just to keep in mind when someone's trying to get their, their kit together or if they're trying to implement some sort of training, throw it down below because there are a lot of experts out there and it is really cool to get all that input. Because again, with CQB, it's all about taking stuff that you're not used to or stuff that you haven't done previously and seeing how your equipment and your tactics work to see if you need to change something up or you know maybe change out some of the gear. Now again, gear is not the be all end all. You can have $40,000 in kits or you can have pan panoramic night vision, all that Gucci stuff. But if you have someone with like a Mosin Nagant and you know a mag light strapped to it, if you run in there and you have no idea what you're doing and they just cast a visible light into your night vision, it's probably not gonna be a good day for you. So definitely make sure you're training, implementing the stuff that you do have and seeing what works. But of course, let me know what you guys think down in the comment section. If you like this, hit the thumbs up. Of course, I like to do these videos every now and again, but I can't always. So if you guys have some recommendations for stuff that I can try and do or implement into a video, then throw it down below as well. But thank you guys for watching. That is it for this video. I will see you all in the next one.